All right. According to my watch and my phone, it is time for this webinar to start. I thank all of you that are joining us. This is the Compassion and Choices series. Um, this will be the fourth we've done on the As the End Nears. And this topic is dying with ALS or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. I am pleased to a co or to moderate this. Uh, I am Corey Carroll, one of the uh, two part-time national uh, directors for Compassion and Choices. Dr. Tomito is, um, as a colleague of mine, is going to help with the question and answers, and he may pop in while we're um, uh, talking if there's a pertinent question, and I'll get into that. And I'm going to introduce our featured speaker in just a, a moment, Dr. Bischoff. So logistics. Um, minimize this little thing so I can read it all. This webinar is going to be recorded and will be sent out um, probably a little bit later with the 4th of July holiday, uh, but you will be able to access that. Um, we are in webinar mode, so you're not able to speak. This allows us to have a good communication. And the question and answers, you have a box at the bottom, Q&A. Please put your questions there. Uh, the chat box, I'm not sure if you can use that. We'll be trying to put uh, links in there for you all to have. Um, but the, the way to get questions to us is through the Q&A box. Now, I am going to introduce our... Oh, and by the way, we do have... Um, and actually, I should... Uh, once I close the slides, we'll, we'll see Eddie, who's going to be in, uh, sign interpreting for us. And that's a wonderful thing to have. Dr. Bischoff is a palliative care physician working at the University of California, San Francisco campus. Um, she does palliative care that works with all sorts of patients with serious illness, but has a passion uh, for those with neurologic diseases such as ALS, which gives her this uh, uh, expertise to speak to us today. She serves as the medical director of UCSF's palliative care program. She earned her medical degree from Harvard. Her residency was completed at in internal medicine at UCSF, and she also served as chief resident. Uh, she completed a fellowship in hospice and palliative medicine there. Dr. Bischoff is a member of the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Member, but more importantly, she's a mother, a Bay Area native, and an outdoor enthusiast. So I'm gonna stop sharing the screens and now we'll see Dr. Bischoff, and I'm just going to read a quick quote that she has with her website, and this is her. I feel privileged to walk with my patients on their journeys, helping them navigate challenges. They inspire me every day. Dr. Bischoff, thank you so very much for uh, helping us with this difficult con conversation, but I think let's start with you telling us uh, what ALS is. Sure, absolutely. Thank you, Corey, for that very nice introduction. And I'm so glad to be with all of you today. In short, ALS is a fatal neurodegenerative disease. And through a loss of motor neurons in ALS, people with the illness experience progressive weakness in all of their skeletal muscles. So most people have a limb predominant form of ALS, which essentially means that the weakness develops first in their limbs arms and legs. So they may experience difficulty walking, for example, loss of strength in their arms and ability to do things they used to be able to do. Um, but then even if the illness develops first in the limbs, it can progress to involve other, other muscle groups. So they may um, lose strength in the muscles of their speech, swallowing and breathing ultimately. And then there's another form of ALS called bulbar ALS that's a little less common but where the weakness develops first in the muscles of speech and swallowing. Um, so they may first present with difficulty speaking, slurred speech, um, or difficulty swallowing, with it becoming more difficult to swallow, choking episodes, for example. And later in the illness, other muscles may be, uh, become weak, for example, the muscles in the limbs and the breathing muscles. And occasionally, very rarely, people develop the um, respiratory or breathing weakness first. So in short, all of these, um, because of the loss of the motor neurons, all of these muscle groups can become weak. And ultimately in ALS, people can um, become nearly paralyzed with an inability to move their limbs, their trunk, um, unable to speak, swallow, and ultimately breathe. 
Yeah, that's that's terrible. And and uh, in my family practice career of 30 years, I've had a few patients. I know you see way more in your center. Um, this used to be called Lou Gehrig's disease, correct? Yes, yeah. exactly. And, Lou Gehrig and, was a baseball player that had the illness um, diagnosed back in 1939 at a young age. And unfortunately, he died from the disease. Right. And that's where it kind of gained uh, notoriety. And and because it is so complicated, as you as you alluded, we're not going to try to, to define the uh, diagnostic criteria because it's just so complicated. However, uh, hopefully we can get this in the chat. There is a link of you speaking to uh, some other physicians back in January of 22 that uh, does a nice job of, of going into more of the uh, medical uh, convention, diagnostic, and even some treatment options. So uh, hopefully uh, if people want to learn a little bit more, that's one opportunity to get that information with Dr. Bischoff in another podcast. You're a busy woman. Um, would you speak to the prognosis of ALS? Sure. So yeah, the prognosis is essentially um, two to five years from the time of diagnosis. Um, so unfortunately, during that time, people with ALS do experience a relentless progression of their weakness. And ultimately, it's um, usually the respiratory or breathing weakness that leads to the end of people's life in ALS within years, a few years of diagnosis. Great. Um, can it be cured? Unfortunately, there is no cure for ALS currently. Um, however, I would mention that there has been certainly some progress in therapeutics in recent years. Um, so there was one medication that has been around for decades called Braluzol. It's sort of the cornerstone of treatment of ALS. It does um, slow the progression of the illness somewhat. Um, and then just in the past few years, in part funded by some um, significant um, money that came in through the ice bucket challenge craze that you may have participated in. Um, there's been more research and additional breakthroughs. For example, there's a medication called Adaravone that was initially available just IV, now also available in an oral form. And another medication called Relivrio um, that both can slow the progression of the illness, um, but don't unfortunately cure it. Um. In the context, just the behaviors, uh, again, not going into the complexity, but is there, are there things that people can do that would uh, minimize, mitigate the, uh, the disease or if they have it to uh, slow the progression on their own? Yeah. So, you know, one really staggering thing about ALS is that there's, um, we really don't know what causes it in most cases. About 10% of cases are familial and run in families and have um, genetic causes, but the majority are not um, familial and have a range of different um, potential contributors. Like we know that people who have been veterans are about twice as likely to get ALS. So there's probably some exposure that can increase someone's risk of ALS. We know that head trauma um, can increase people's risk of ALS. Um, there are other um, exposures, but really we don't know the majority of the, the factors that contribute to people's risk of ALS. That being said, once people have ALS, there are things that they can do to slow the progression. Um, I'm happy to talk about each of this in more detail, but but really it has to do with working with uh, therapists, physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech and swallow therapists, um, to try to do you know, rehab and exercises to maintain the strength they have for as long as possible. And also think about you know, how to adapt their own um, behaviors and use uh, equipment in order to preserve one's function as long as possible in the face of the progressive weakness. Yeah, very good point. So it sounds like, you know, as a family doc, I, I'm trying to help my patients avoid many uh, chronic diseases. And, and this is the same where what you eat is critically important, avoiding a lot of processed foods, avoiding things that, you know, could potentially be dangerous. Um, but sometimes we can't, especially if, if you're uh, exposed in the military, etc. cetera. Um, and, and you mentioned the progression and, and the fact that we'll begin to see in these folks uh, changes that occur. Um, because it's so complicated, we'll also put another link in the chat which talks about 
a ALS functional rating scale. Uh, and can you tell me as a clinician, as uh, you're watching these patients, they've been diagnosed, um, what are you looking for? We're, and again, the link will give the, all the, the specifics, but um, kind of the, the process of decline, how would you, how would you uh, explain that to our audience? Yeah, so there's the progression and the weakness, which I've already alluded to. Um, and so that can lead to people being less able to walk or unable to walk unable to dress oneself, feed oneself, all those different important activities of daily living. Um, but in addition to the weakness, people with ALS can also develop spasticity and muscle cramps. So that's another very common symptom that we see in ALS and that we do treat um, with medications as well as other strategies. We also, as I've mentioned, um, see swallowing difficulty develop. So we screen for that. We want to make sure that people are still able to swallow in order to eat adequate calories so that the, the lack of calories isn't contributing to the progression of their weakness. Um, and we also wanna make sure that people are um, not having frequent choking episodes. Sometimes when there's swallowing difficulty, um, saliva can also pool in the mouth and lead to drooling, which people don't like. And so we um, look for that issue and, and can treat it with medications that decrease saliva production, as well as giving people um, devices like a suction machine to help them suction excess saliva to minimize drooling. And, um, you know, when swallowing difficulty becomes really advanced, such that eating is burdensome um, or dangerous, um, people can both modify their diets and work with a swallowing therapist, and but then they may also face the decision about whether to have a feeding tube placed. It can be a surgical, small surgical procedure where a tube is placed through the skin into the stomach, um, and artificial nutrition can be delivered that way that can supplement or replace what people are eating by mouth. Um, and then we look for communication challenges, you know, as people lose their ability to speak, um, their speech might become more slurred, it may be more difficult and burdensome to speak, um, or they may not be able to speak at all at some point. And so um, we encourage patients to work with um, speech therapists to maintain their ability to speak as long as possible, and then also to learn about um, tools um, to use when they're not able to speak. Um, well, so for example, there's a whole range of them, but there's a text to speech app, for example, where people can type things into their phone, type what they want to say, and then the phone can speak for them. Um, or, you know, um, for a more advanced form of ALS, when someone is not able to text on their phone, they may instead use an eye gaze device, um, which is something that a person wears on their head. Um, it connects with a computer, and then they're actually able to um, look at letters or words on the screen in order to have the computer then speak them those words for them. So that's an example of another um, communication device that people can um, can learn to use and be connected with. Um, and then when we also look for respiratory or breathing weakness, when people become short of breath or their respiratory strength is progressing, people often benefit from a mask that they wear on their face that provides extra support for breathing. And this can um, both alleviate shortness of breath. It can also give people a little bit more energy because when the breathing muscles are weak, it can take a lot of energy just to breathe. So people can rest better and feel um, feel like they have more restorative sleep and feel um, like they have more energy when they use a mask to support their breathing. And then at very advanced stages, when the breathing weakness advances further, people um, with ALS face the decision about whether they'd want to be put on a ventilator through um, a tracheostomy, which is a tube that's surgically inserted into the neck um, for a, a higher level of um, breathing support. Right. And then I would also say, oh, sorry. No. Um, just finally that, you know, throughout the illness, we also look for mood changes. Um, mm -hmm which are very, very common in this illness. Um, understandably, people going through all of these progressive changes can um, experience more depressed or anxious mood at times. So we look for those issues and we treat them in both in the pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic ways. There's also um, a particular issue um, 
called pseudobulbar affect that some people with ALS can develop, which is inappropriate laughter or crying that can happen and be quite dramatic. And that also has a treatment um, for it. Um, and finally, I would say that um, up to about 50% of people with ALS can have some degree of cognitive impairment as part of the illness. And generally this is quite mild and it's actually um, under-recognized as a result, but about 15% of people can progress to a real dementia picture. So we also screen for that and because um, that's a really important issue to kind of help counsel people and family members about and help them figure out how to care for their loved one if that does develop. Yeah, so uh, boy, thank you. That was uh, thorough. And, and uh, you know, as I was thinking, I was an engineer before I went to medical school and, and I, I really enjoy technology, especially we can help people. And these are folks that are becoming more and more disabled. So the powered wheelchairs and the eye gaze technology, it's fascinating in uh, ALS that the uh, extraocular muscles, these muscles that move the eyes seem to be spared mm -hmm. and also sphincters, which are kind of nice to keep functioning. So uh, mm -hmm. these uh, patients, even if they can, if they lose all of their ability to move their limbs and their fingers and lose speech and swallowing, they still have the ability to use their eye. And the eye gaze technology allows that uh, reflection off the cornea to let them type on a screen or hit buttons. And it's, it really is a, an extender for them to stay connected. Yes. So I'm going to focus on that um, technologic uh, component, and we're going to put another link in. You were a co-author on a paper entitled, entitled Embedded Palliative Care for Amyotrophic Lateral Sclerosis. And, and at your institution, there's this unique collaboration between the neurologic uh, uh, group and the palliative care group. And um, could you talk a little bit, because it... it as you were mentioning the decline, boy, the need for support and assessment and inclusion of more uh, devices really gets complicated. And I think you figured out some uh, mechanisms at your university to, uh, to, to fix some of that. Sure, yeah. So at UCSF, um, we do have an interdisciplinary palliative care team. So that uh, includes doctors, a nurse, a social worker, a spiritual care provider, and a practice coordinator. And we all work um, together with the members of the ALS team, which includes an ALS neurologist, as well as a lot of therapists, like respiratory therapists, physical therapists. But our focus in palliative care is to provide that extra layer of support to people and families facing this devastating illness. So, um, you know, we are often referred um, patients by the ALS team really from the time of diagnosis. The ALS team um, and our team have been working closely together since 2017. We've developed a very robust collaboration and we're all true believers, I think, in the, um, the need to have this wraparound support um, from all different, all these different disciplines. So in palliative care, we sometimes describe our work as falling into three broad buckets. Um, first is symptom management. So we help to address both physical and mood symptoms using both medications and other strategies. Um, we just provide a little bit more bandwidth to do that than, than what the ALS team does as well. And number two, we help people think um, with advanced care planning. So really thinking in advance about the illness that they're facing, what's likely to come and trying to understand people's values and priorities to make sure that they get the medical care that they want. And then the third bucket is that we offer that extra layer of support to both people and their family um, caregivers who are going through this illness. Um, and so, you know, I, I mentioned that we have different disciplines on our team, and I really want to emphasize the importance of the work that the non-physicians do on our team. So, you know, while as a doctor, I might see a patient um, and family together and um, screen for symptoms and try to manage those symptoms with giving, you know, medications, for example, um, our nurse is actually the one that follows up with the patient or family between the scheduled visits to really understand, were they able to get that medication? Did they try it? Did it work? Um, were there any side effects that developed? Um, our nurse is also the person who answers the calls, um, you know, when people call in about 
new issues that have come up unexpectedly, whether that's a symptom or a practical concern, um, for example. And then our social worker plays a huge role um, providing emotional support to patients and families. So the social worker often meets with a, a patient or a family member one-on-one -on -one between the physician visits um, to offer supportive counseling, um, you know, some mental health care, um, and to also help with practical issues, like if they want to hire a caregiver for the home, the social worker might help with that type of thing, or if the family wants to um, apply for the Family Medical Leave Act, for example. And then our spiritual care provider really provides, again, emotional and existential support to patients and family members. So um, very understandably, these are common in an illness as devastating as ALS. And so the um, spiritual care provider, again, will meet with patients or family members one-on-one, -on -one, will sometimes um, do legacy work, thinking about you know, what are the things that they want to um, do and say in the limited time they have remaining, or what do they want to leave for their loved ones? Um, and um, yeah, it uses a range of modalities, including you know, mindfulness to help them cope with the difficult circumstances. Absolutely, team approach. And, and, and we recognize that San Francisco is not uh, like rural Colorado or uh, some other place, but I think that the message that that we would like to uh, push out is that at, at your university, at your facility, you definitely saw how this can enhance uh, patient care, uh, acceptance of the disease, support the family. So wherever uh, individuals are that have this diagnosis, uh, tap into all the resources you can and encourage that that will work. Let's talk uh, now a little bit about the dark side and, and as the end nears is our uh, webinar is entitled. So um, obviously um, patients are certainly aware of what's happening. Um, can you not only maybe uh, give us a feel uh, in your experience working with patients, what their fears are, but, but truly what they are going to die from? Yeah. Yeah. So often um, people's lives end in ALS as a result of the respiratory weakness. So um, ultimately that's the part of the illness that is most often, uh, you know, leads to one's death. And so um, more specifically, when people's breathing is weak, when they don't have an effective cough, for example, to clear their lungs, or when their swallow is weak, they're at risk for having an aspiration event, which is when food, fluid, or saliva can go down from the throat into the lungs um, and may be difficult to clear in this setting, and then that can lead to pneumonia. Um, so pneumonia is very common. Um, and we do treat it with antibiotics and often with a, a breathing support, like through a mask, for example. Um, but even with those treatments, it may not be something um, that can um, that a person with ALS or advanced ALS can recover from. So that's the most common cause of death. Um, I would also say even in the absence of a really obvious aspiration event or pneumonia, um, sometimes people with ALS can just stop breathing, even if they are wearing a mask to support their breathing. And so sometimes um, a respiratory death can happen a little bit more unexpectedly. Um, and then sometimes people with ALS die of other causes, um, including urinary tract infections, for example, which are just common in people who aren't mobile um, and you know are more likely to become fatal in someone who's who's malnourished or chronically ill from an illness like ALS. So um, yeah, having a medical team involved, can you uh, again, where you're at, you have this marvelous uh, collaboration with the palliative care. Um, perhaps that's not available everywhere, but hospice seems to have pretty good uh, penetration. Um, discuss where hospice would, uh, or maybe um, differentiate palliative care and hospice, and then uh, in ALS patients where uh, hospice would come into the picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, as I'm sure this crowd is well aware, hospice is a program that's appropriate for people who have a prognosis of less than six months. Um, so that's different than palliative care, which can be appropriate for people with a serious illness at any stage of the illness. 
And as I mentioned, we often see people from the time of diagnosis. Um, but in short, when people get to a point with ALS where their prognosis is less than six months, which we usually determine um, by uh, based on the extent of their respiratory weakness, since the respiratory weakness is generally what leads to the end of someone's life in ALS, and we also take into account their overall trajectory. Um, but if a prognosis, if someone's prognosis does seem like it's less than six months, um, we, you know, off, we always talk about hospice, and it can be really helpful and appropriate if people's um, goals of care are aligned with hospice. So um, in addition to being a program for people with a prognosis of less than six months, hospice is also a program where the, um, you know, the main focus is on providing comfort and ensuring that people are peaceful in the place where they want to be, which is generally home. Um, so for many of our patients with advanced ALS, their goals are consistent with hospice, you know, comfort and being able to stay in place at home is what's most important to them. But for other people, they still want to pursue disease um, modifying and life prolonging treatments like a Daravone or a Livrio that I mentioned, or um, they may want to be on a ventilator through a tracheostomy. Um, and those types of life prolonging treatments are generally not consistent with hospice care. But regardless of whether someone you know, chooses hospice or not, um, we in palliative care um, will stay involved with them throughout the, you know, the end, until the end of their lives. Yeah, I, I can't remember, but I think, uh, well, palliative care can participate anytime in the disease. Mm -hmm progress. There doesn't need to be a, a, a six-month prognosis. So that's that's a wonderful option. Um, yeah, so this is a, a, a very scary disease for the patient and the family, and, and again, more support. Um, but as, as you've mentioned, you know, there's no cure. This is a progressive disease. It will end in death. So all of these interventions, uh, feeding to placement, certainly a trait to are are optional and at the patient's discretion. Um, how's the, you know, th this is always tough as a doctor to uh, try to say, boy, I want to help you, but I know what I do won't really change the inevitable. How, how do you help patients in this difficult discussion of aggressive treatment? Maybe think towards the respiratory. Um, yeah, then alleviating the fear of, well, what do I do if I don't do a trait two, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, you're right. The people with ALS face a lot of decisions about their care. Um, and I think I might mention the feeding tube piece first, because that often comes up earlier in the course of the illness. And then I'll get to the um, ventilator piece. But um, so when people with ALS are unable to sort of keep up with a, you know, and be able to ingest as many calories as their body needs because of difficulty swallowing, for example, or sometimes it's just limb weakness makes it difficult to get enough food to their mouth. Um, but when people are losing weight or when meals are becoming just very protracted and burdensome, or when there's scary choking episodes, that's when we often bring up a feeding tube as an option. And um, I think actually a lot of people initially have an aversion to feeding tubes and they say, I wouldn't want that because it sounds really unappealing um, or because they wanna be able to continue to eat as it's a great source of pleasure for most of us. Um, but we do talk to people about how a feeding tube can actually improve quality of life for many people as well as um, extend life by way of making sure they get adequate calories. So sometimes um, I've, I've seen people for whom those meals have become just a great source of stress or really protracted, exhausting episodes. Um, and they're spending a lot of their time, you know, more than an hour um, for each meal trying to get the food in safely. And so in those cases, I've seen feeding tubes, um, though, of course, no surgical procedure is a small deal when it's happening to you. Um, but still, I've seen feeding tubes go smoothly and um, be able to alleviate that stress and burden and improve quality of life in that way. And also, I would mention that when people aren't getting adequate um, calories in, that can accelerate the progression of the weakness in ALS. So um, by right. getting more 
more calories in via the feeding tube, it can slow the progression or prevent the accelerated progression. And also uh, minimize the aspiration pneumonia. The the if you're if you're avoiding swallowing because you have a different a port of entry, then that decreases the likelihood of an aspiration pneumonia. And these folks could exist uh, after a feeding tube is placed for years, correct? Yeah, yeah. So it, I'd say the majority of people with ALS do end up having a feeding tube placed, um, and it can be even in early stages of the disease. And people can continue to eat and drink for pleasure on top of the nutrition that they get through the feeding tube. So I just wanted to mention that it's a very different situation and consideration than a feeding tube in advanced dementia, which I think a lot of us are, um, you know, more used to thinking about. Um, and then just as you mentioned, um, the, the decisions around um, breathing support are very, um, can be very weighty ones um, as well in this illness. So as the breathing um, gets weaker, um, and particularly if people get short of, feel short of breath, they're often given a mask to support their breathing. That's called non-invasive ventilation. It's not invasive. You can put it on, you can take it off. Um, and people often wear that at home, sometimes first at night, and then maybe at night plus during a nap um, or rest period during the day, and sometimes progress to using it for the majority of the day. Um, but if the, as the weakness progresses, people also face this decision about whether they'd like to have a surgical procedure to have a tracheostomy, which is um, a tube inserted through the neck, um, and then they can be put on a ventilator um, to provide a greater, you know, degree, amount of respiratory support. Um, and um, one thing that's important to know with a ventilator is that um, this does lead to people being tied to a machine. Um, so it does limit mobility. Um, occasionally I've seen people put a ventilator um, on a wheelchair, for example, and get around, but this is you know, not, not terribly common. It's certainly a, um, a significant thing to be tied to a ventilator all the time. It also requires a lot of management. So family or friends can be trained um, to manage a ventilator at home, um, but these machines do have very frequent alarms um, and need for suctioning, for example. Um, so someone has to be managing that ventilator 24 seven. Um, occasionally that can be done um, by one, loving, devoted family member, but much more often it requires a team of uh, two, three or more people to be able to be, you know, alert and attentive to the machine and ready to suction at any moment 24 seven around the clock. And because of that, it can be extremely expensive um, to be at, at home with a ventilator. Um, and finally, I would say that, you know, when people get to a point of needing a ventilator um, or invasive ventilation, um, their illness is usually very advanced. And um, for, for all, and many people feel like that's not a condition in which they'd want to prolong their life. So for sort of all of these reasons, it's only about five to 10% of people with ALS who choose mechanical ventilation via tracheostomy. Um, the large majority of people with ALS in the US do not choose this and would prefer um, to stay with non-invasive ventilation, if any, breathing support. Right. So uh, thank you. Let's, let's talk about other options in the patient who has uh, uh, moved forward on this disease to the point. And again, you mentioned the respiratory failure. We, we have uh, pulmonary function test and spirometry, different ways of assessing that. So, um, and you, let's go back to the feeding tube. Um, what if a patient uh, makes the decision, if I can't swallow and I don't want a feeding tube, I will just stop eating and drinking. Is mm -hmm. that something you've seen in your practice? Yeah, yeah, certainly. So, um, that, that is sometimes the case that people don't want a feeding tube and usually they'll continue to eat and drink by mouth to the extent that it is um, you know, comfortable to do, um, but generally they'll decline sort of gradually. Less often, but occasionally people make a more um, 
you know, dramatic or choice to stop eating and drinking altogether. Um, and that can be difficult, particularly in the first few days where there's some hunger and especially thirst. But then after a few days, generally people become less hungry, less thirsty, also often um, more fatigued and less aware. And, um, you know, generally speaking, people will die from not eating or drinking within a couple of weeks. Yeah. And that is a, a, an option, not just for ALS, but, you know, essentially any individual, um, yeah. hopefully of sound mind and, and competency can, can make that decision to voluntarily stop, eat and drink, which is one way to, to peacefully transition um, where they're at. Um, and in Colorado and in California and 10 other states in the District of Columbia, there is another option that has been uh, written into statute uh, that allows uh, uh, competent adult, typically citizens, uh, although we can talk a little bit about the nuance of Vermont and Oregon, but uh, terminal illness, six months to live, and able to ingest medications. They can ask their physician if the physician participates to prescribe medications that will hasten their death and they will take those. What, what's your experience since you are in California with patients asking for medical aid in dying? Yeah, so it is absolutely something that comes up in ALS. In fact, ALS is the disease where the highest percentage of people pursue medical aid in dying compared to all you know, um, serious illnesses. So there was a study done in Oregon and Washington that found that about 5% of people with ALS in those states um, pursued medical aid in dying and ended their life in that way, which is much higher than it is for cancer, for example, or any other um, serious illness. Um, so this is something that comes up frequently, at least questions about it come up very frequently in our practice. Um, and it is something where we do support people when they qualify and they feel clearly and consistently interested in that, this. Um, but one complicating factor, as you alluded to, Corey, is that um, there is this requirement in California, as well as most other states where medical aid and dying is legal, that people self-ingest the medications. So the options for how to do that are either um, to drink the medications down, they come as a powder and they're mixed in a liquid. And then um, a person who's interested in pursuing medical aid and dying can either drink the medications or can self-administer them through a feeding or a rectal tube. Um, but some people with ALS who are at the point of wanting to pursue medical aid and dying um, may have lost their ability to swallow as well as their um, manual dexterity to be able to administer through a feeding or rectal tube. So when we hear that someone is interested in having medical aid and dying as an option, we do have to consider those things in ALS. Um, do they still have the ability to self-ingest either by mouth or via a tube? Um, right. And that can be a stressful, a stressful thing for some people to consider because we absolutely don't want anyone to feel rushed to pursue this before they're ready, that's for sure. And um, we want people to understand that there's a possibility that they could lose their ability to self-ingest. Right. And um, given that um, not breathing and uh, becoming weaker and weaker do, do have symptoms, in the world of palliative care, uh, there are certainly, as you mentioned, medications to decrease uh, the saliva, uh, mm -hmm. to help with anxiety, to help with any discomfort, muscle cramps, joint pain. Mm -hmm. What about just in that, uh, in the, the terminal process and uh, the term of palliative sedation? How would you uh, educate our audience on that phenomenon? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the majority of people with ALS really die from the progressive respiratory weakness. And often we use medications like opioids, sometimes with benzodiazepines to you know, ease the breathing, prevent any shortness of breath. Um, and in the process, sometimes the use, of the use of these medicines also leads to some mild sedation that can kind of help ease the, um, the dying process. So, um, I honestly wouldn't consider that, you know, full-blown palliative sedation. I would 
instead call it um, treating their shortness of breath as they die from um, progressive respiratory failure. Um, but we do use opioids and benzodiazepines. And with these medications, generally um, dying from ALS can be made comfortable and peaceful as far as we can tell. So that is really the most common way that people um, with ALS die is, um, is from the, the respiratory progression and possibly with some meds for comfort. But I would also say that, um, you know, even short of voluntary cessation of eating and drinking or medical aid and dying, there's also an option in ALS to stop life prolonging treatments. So many people with ALS do get to a place where they um, are dependent on a mask, for example, in order to live. And so um, they can, if if they get to a point where they don't feel their quality of life is acceptable or they don't wanna live any longer, they do have the legal option to stop that life prolonging treatment, not use the mask and use more medicines to make sure that they're comfortable and without shortness of breath at that time. And that can be another way that people um, with ALS can end their lives. Right, even uh, individuals that have opted for intubation, there is a kind and compassionate sedation that can occur when they make that decision to turn off the ventilator. So absolutely hospice palliative care critical at the end stage of, of this and everybody dying. Mm -hmm. um, let's let's focus um, as you've talked uh, about the options, how um, how would you uh, uh, advise patients uh, to give their loved ones and the medical community, their desires on how to progress further with the disease, understanding that that's a, a moving dynamic that can change from day yeah. to day. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, particularly in ALS, but also in other illnesses, we try to encourage people to talk, think and talk about their wishes uh, for future medical care early in the illness, particularly because in ALS, the communication challenges can make it more difficult to have really um, nuanced uh, conversations later on in some cases. So one of the really important things we try to encourage people to think about early is um, who would their surrogate decision maker be? Who would they want to make medical decisions for them if they couldn't make them for themselves? Um, and knowing that communication challenges may develop or cognitive impairment may develop, I think there's a lot of reasons um, to try to designate a surrogate decision maker early on. And then to have conversations with that person about um, your overall values and priorities, you know, what you're hoping for and what you're worried about um, as the illness progresses, as well as you know, any feelings you might have around specific medical decisions like um, a feeding tube or ventilatory support. Um, but as you mentioned, Corey, sometimes people's feelings about specific um, interventions can shift in time. So possibly the most important thing is designating that surrogate and then having a broad conversation about your values and priorities and um, up, you know, keeping that conversation open and updated um, as much as possible throughout the illness. Good advice uh, for everybody. Um, having um, a durable power of attorney, a surrogate, having advanced directives, and something that uh, that we're definitely uh, seeing a valuable is the video of of the individual talking and uh, giving that statement. So, if there are family members, loved ones that um, don't feel comfortable with that decision, there's more than just a document or somebody else saying something. So, that's a great idea. Yeah. Any, anything else? We're going to move into the um, question and answer here in a little bit. Anything you want to uh, say that I've, uh, now I probably missed a lot, but anything <laughs> to add? Well, I think, you know, ALS is an illness that's understandably very scary to many people. Um, so I think I just want to come back and emphasize that there's a lot that can be done to manage the symptoms of the illness. Um, the weakness may be difficult to reverse. Um, it can be slowed with some newer medications, but it can be, it's very difficult to reverse, but 
um, there is a lot that can be done um, with you know, therapy with equipment, um, technology, medications, um, and certainly the end of life from ALS um, is generally not painful or terribly uncomfortable. There are medications that can be given to alleviate shortness of breath, um, pain, and other symptoms. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention is that there is a really amazing community in ALS and um, a community of support. And for example, the ALS Association is a terrific advocacy organization that really has incredible supportive services, both for patients and family members. Um, they have support groups, for example. They also have um, case managers who can come to the home and support people and families facing ALS, learn to use some of the equipment. They have a loan closet um, where they can help get you the equipment while you're waiting for it to be um, approved by insurance, et cetera, et cetera. So I do think um, there's an amazing community of support with this illness that's worth exploring if you unfortunately face it. Right. And, and I'm going to just say one thing and I'll let Mitz start asking the questions. But uh, as we are doing here, virtual meetings in your paper, you indicated that a lot of, because it's very difficult to transport an individual who is in a wheelchair that's weak and tired. So mm -hmm. using virtual technology allows the, these other systems to play in a lot easier than it has been in the past. Yes, that's right. Yeah, we're seeing the vast majority of our patients with ALS by video. Um, and that's been the case since even before the pandemic. Um, and yeah, one reason for that is that ALS is a rare disease. So the ALS clinic at UCSF draws patients from all over Northern California and sometimes beyond. And so, um, you know, it's a wide geographic catchment area and it's a very long distance, very burdensome um, trip for people with ALS and their families to make. To maybe, come maybe, to after, maybe after today's visit, you'll have more patients, but. <laughs> yeah, yes. we're glad to be able to reach people in their homes. It's been actually really, really neat to be able to provide care that way. Mitch, I'll let you uh, pop the questions, please. Okay, well, let me start by a question that came up with regards to the use of psychedelics. This is a kind of a hot topic. Still probably, well, any, any thoughts or comments on that? Yeah, good question. I mean, not specific to ALS, to be honest. I'm not aware of any um, research um, that's being done specifically around psychedelics in ALS, although I'd love to learn if anyone knows of such things. But I think in general, psychedelics um, around the end of life to treat existential distress um, and in palliative care is a really fascinating topic. I agree um, that holds great promise. I think that the research is still quite nascent, but um, certainly an area that I'm keeping keeping an eye on in the coming years. Colorado last year passed um, a law that allowed psilocybin, which is the magic mushrooms, to uh, decriminalize possession. However, because these have been controlled substances, the research, is, as Cara has indicated, is, is, is missing. We'll get there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There were several questions with regards to medical aid in dying. And so what are, can you go into maybe some more of the dilemmas or experience or nuances with regards to medical aid in dying uh, with uh, individuals that have ALS? Yeah, so I think one of the trickiest pieces is what I um, briefly alluded to when uh, when people lose their ability to swallow um, and maybe also losing their ability to um, to basically plunge a plunger in order to administer a medication to themselves through a peg tube or a rectal tube. This can be, you know, a difficult situation. And we just try to um, talk to people about medical aid and dying early if this is something that they've expressed an interest in and educate them about their options and about the legal requirements so that they can make an informed choice. Um, you know, and some times, you know, some of our patients are actively monitoring their ability to swallow four ounces of liquid in, you know, two minutes, um, which they have heard is a is necessary in order to be able to self-ingest these medications just so that they know, is this still an option to me or is it not? Um, and to say just a note more about the rectal tube piece, um, first of all, there's the American Academy for Cl um, 
American Clinicians Academy on Medical Aid and Dying. That is a really great um, research and advocacy organization that I'd, I'd recommend um, to people who are trying to learn more about this. But one um, thing you can learn about on their website is this option of um, having a rectal tube place, which is generally something that a nurse can do, whether that's a hospice nurse or another nurse, um, and in order to have another route um, for people to ingest medical aid and dying medicines if they're not able to swallow them and they don't have a feeding tube placed. It's, you know, might be a little bit counterintuitive, but it can actually be more comfortable to have a rectal tube in place um, than a, the feeding tube through the nose um, it, for this purpose. So um, that is an option for people who are unable to swallow as long as they have the dex hand dexterity to be able to plunge that plunger again. And the, uh, the, the fascinating uh, issue is the mucosa in the rectal area will absorb the medications just as well as in the upper gastrointestinal tract. So we don't even have to alter the medications. Mm -hmm. now I'm not going to go into, you know, it, it, the, the verbiage of the law. And, uh, you know, you need a, a attending physician, a consulting physician. Uh, the patient has to have the same criteria for hospice prognosis of six months or less and mm -hmm. a terminal illness. And they have to have mental capacity. So there's, these are other hurdles that, that, that all people in states where this is recognized have to, to jump through. ALS adds that component of, oh my gosh, uh, I may not be able to, to use my hand, uh, even to, to move my wheelchair. I've heard from a physician where a patient used their electric wheelchair to depress the plunger. Um, and you know, I think that's in, they're self-ingesting the medication. They're in total control. Um, but yes, the, the, the whole concept of getting this medicine is not in, in uh, uh, detractors or opponents are, are thinking that it will, um, you know, take, uh, be used in, in appropriate situations. And the opposite is true. It actually is very hard to do. And it, it's, I think, an option for people that choose it. And those that don't choose it, we have palliative care, hospice care, natural cause. Mm -hmm. So shortness of breath, masks, ventilators, trachs, could you provide a little bit more information about the end of life and end of life choices and peacefulness with regards to respiratory um, failure? Absolutely. Yeah. So um, a lot of people with ALS, when their respiratory um, failure is progressing, they are prescribed this non-invasive ventilation, which is a mask that they can place over their nose and mouth and um, that provides some sort of pressure um, that supports their breathing, helps get the air into their lungs um, when their muscles are weak. And so um, that's that's used by you know, a good percentage of people with ALS. Whereas, as I mentioned, that um, endotracheal invasive ventilation um, is an option chosen by a much smaller group of people, um, about five to 10% of people in this country, higher in some other countries like Japan, by the way, but, um, but quite uncommonly chosen in this country. Um, but, you know, at the end of life, if someone has decided that they don't feel their quality of life is acceptable, they don't want to prolong their life any further in the face of this illness, they do have the option to stop either of those forms of ventilatory support. Um, so if you're using a mask, it's actually a very easy process of just taking off the straps or not putting it on when you normally would. Um, but at that time, we as palliative care docs would wanna make sure that you have medications like opioids. An example is morphine. Um, usually we give this in a liquid formulation and starting at a low dose um, because those opioid medications can take the edge off the shortness of breath feeling. We sometimes think of them as pain medication, but actually they do ease shortness of breath as well and can prevent people from feeling a sensation of air hunger when they are going without their mask. Um, and then in the ventil, you know, if you're on a ventilator, it's a little bit more of a procedure. It's usually, you know, done either in a hospital or by a highly, um, you know, knowledgeable, experienced hospice team um, at home. But um, in those cases, if you wanted to come off of a ventilator, you would be given opioid medications ahead of time to make sure you're not short of breath. And then the ventilator 
settings would be turned down um, and the tube may or may not be removed ultimately. Um, but I think the key really is that you do have options to stop life prolonging treatments if you get to a place where you want to and that there are medications to ensure comfort through that process. Could you share some of the, you mentioned this is about dementia and cognitive impairment, which raises a lot of difficult mm -hmm. issues. Share some of the dilemmas or challenges or processes that yeah. a certain decision maker deciding about competency, things of that sort. That's that's a, well. Yeah. Yeah. So in the 15% of cases of ALS where there's um, dementia, it's usually the frontotemporal dementia. I know we'll have a later talk about types of dementia, but um, but it can be actually quite challenging with sort of um, a change in people's judgment. And um, it can sometimes, and, and behavior, and it can sometimes make people with ALS very difficult to care for. They may be doing things that are impulsive or not safe or not consistent with the care plan that the caregiver is trying to carry out. So that can be really difficult. And honestly, our role in palliative care in those cases is in large part um, supporting the caregivers. Um, it can be frustrating, exhausting, um, just overwhelming at times to try to care for a loved one that's both you know, significantly functionally impaired may need treatments or like a ventilatory support, but also may not understand their need for those things um, and doing things that are impulsive or um, difficult to manage. So a lot of it is training and support for the caregiver, trying to help them figure out how to manage the difficult you know, circumstances that may arise. Sometimes we use medications for, um, for agitation um, in the patient, um, particularly when it's leading to unsafe behavior. Um, and then in terms of decision making, you know, we really for each individual decision, we have to assess the patient's uh, capacity to make that decision or not. So a person with dementia might have the capacity to choose whether they want ice cream or not. You know, they may have the capacity to make a simple decision, but at the same time, they might not have capacity to make a really complex decision, like whether to um, do a ventilator or not, or use their mask or not. On the other hand, you know, they may not have the capacity to make the decision to not use, wear their mask, but at the same time, they, it may be very difficult to get someone who's not <laughs> wanting to put, wear their mask to wear it. So we have to be, um, try to assess people's capacity to make the decision, work with the surrogate decision maker to use substituted judgment to make decisions on, the, on behalf of the patient um, if the patient doesn't have capacity, but we also have to be just realistic about what can be accomplished um, in the course of care as well. There's a question with regards to that mask that seems to put some pressure on it. Is there a name for that kind of mask? Sure, yeah. So it's sometimes called non-invasive ventilation. It's sometimes called BiPAP. Um, biphasic positive airway pressure. So yeah, yeah there's a couple of different types of masks. There's one that goes over the nose and mouth. There's one that just goes over the nose, which is called nasal BiPAP. So there are different options that may be tried to try to figure out what's most comfortable. Yeah, and then the hours are by quickly. I'm gonna, Corey, I'm gonna leave it for you. You got just a few minutes to wrap it up. And again, thank you very much for- Oh, you look, yeah. Those uh, those devices are commonly used in obstructive sleep apnea, so it's not something that is difficult to find. They are uh, available at all the respiratory uh, centers. Um, Dr. Bischoff, I thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart for taking the time out and, and uh, talking with us. Um, I see we have um, over 350 participants, so I know you've reached a lot of folks. I apologize for questions that we haven't gotten to, uh, but I will go ahead and wrap up. And once again, thank you. And thanks to the uh, folks that are attending. So um, and there we go. So compassion and choices, where are you? There we go. Okay. This is the uh, group that improves care, expands options, empowers everyone to chart their 
end of life journey. And uh, this is just one option that we talked about this end of life symposium. There are many other tools. Uh, just visit compassionandchoices.org and you can see the things we're working on. And um, we're trying to, to just tackle this very difficult question as we did here and, and do it in a way that's compassionate and rational. Uh, Dr. Tomito mentioned the dementia. We are going to skip the summer, but pencil in August 8th at uh, 12 p.m. Pacific time, 3 p.m. Eastern time is what we have planned. And you could learn more um, at the uh, organization at the end nears with hyphens in between on that and sign up. This is the fourth of the uh, webinars. Dr. Will Hoyt and Dr. Warwick talked about congestive heart failure. That's available on recording. There's one on renal failure, one on metastatic cancer, and they are available to look at. Again, this will uh, take a while to get posted, but these are all recorded. So if you need to watch them or would like to share them with somebody, they are available for that. Please follow us on social media if you do that sort of thing. I don't, but I'm sure many of you do, and, and we have a presence on these sites. And I will ask uh, since Compassion and Choices is a 501c3, we are funded by ex almost exclusively by individual donors. So we would greatly appreciate if you think this is a valuable uh, process argument, uh, go to our website and please uh, uh, give whatever you can. We greatly appreciate it so we can keep moving on. And I thank Dr. Bischoff again. And with that, I will sign off. Thank you very much. <laughs>